So good afternoon, everybody. It um, gives me tremendous privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, Governor Pat McCrory. Um, I've given a small introduction, and we're going to have an informal conversation about some critical questions. Uh, in ways of introduction, I've introduced the governor quite a few times, it never gets old. Uh, governor Pat McCrory knows the importance of STEM education, how important it is for North Carolina to bridge the STEM jobs gap. In his most recent State of the State address, he said, we must make sure we're making investments in the programs that will prepare our students for the global economy and close the North Carolina skills gap. He also has a tremendously keen appreciation for just how challenging the teaching profession is. Uh, when you get a moment, just ask him to tell you about his first day as a student teacher in Spencer, North Carolina. Uh, very interesting stories. Uh, that experience, his business experience, and his record uh, seven terms as mayor of Charlotte have all contributed to his commitment to connecting North Carolinians with the education needed to find great jobs and fuel the state's economy. We're so pleased that Governor McCrory is going to join us today for an informal conversation with education. Please join me in welcoming Governor Pat McCrory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. I got a standing ovation. I must be outside of Raleigh. <laughs> no. It's great to be here. I, we thought about giving a speech, and we just thought it'd be better to have a conversation instead of me reading from the podium. And you ask me whatever question you like, and I'll be glad to take any questions from the floor, too, if anyone has any. Wonderful. It's an honor. And thanks to the chamber, June Atkinson. Great seeing you. And, and thanks for being a great partner, too. Really appreciate it. All right, so I've got a few questions just to start the dialogue here. Um, so Governor McCrory, uh, to start off with, what were the biggest education challenges that you confronted when you came into the office? Uh, I think we had several huge education challenges, and we continue to do that. One is we needed to break down the silos of education. And June's been a great partner in that. Uh, the education cabinet, which by charter has been supposed to be getting together the people in charge of preschool, uh, June Atkinson, uh, the head of the university system, the head of the community college system, they had not been meeting for over three years. And Eric Gukan, who was my education advisor up until last week, got us all together and we started, instead of acting as though we were four different silos of education, we needed to act as one silo of education, that is, uh, K-0 through 20, and even K-0 through adult learning, and start talking about sharing our budgets, start talking about sharing our philosophies, start talking about sharing strategies, start talking about sharing resources. And we've made great progress in the past two years in doing just that, and just beginning to trust each other as opposed to competing against each other with each silo, which is the typical thing we tend to do in government. The second thing that we had a major challenge on was that uh, there is a skills gap in North Carolina and in our nation. And you may have been talking about this, but employers throughout the state of North Carolina, as I recruit new employers, were saying, we have job openings, but we cannot fill the people, we cannot find the people with the right skills to fill the jobs. Uh, this is primarily in uh, mechanics, electronics, IT, nursing, accountants, and the list goes on. And that made our job to recruit and retain industry even more difficult. So we thought there was a disconnect between education and commerce. We need to bring those two together. And then we had some immediate issues. Um, in K through 12, our teachers uh, had not been given pay raises except for um, step up increases for experienced teachers in the past five or six years, partly due to the recession, partly due to politics and other things. And we were losing teachers, especially we weren't recruiting entry-level teachers because we had teachers making approximately $30,000 a year entry-level, and they were stuck on that salary for the first seven years. And we saw that the attrition was highest between one and seven years, so we worked with the legislature to get salary increases to increase the base pay from $30,000 a year, regardless of where you live, to $35,000 a year, a $5,000 increase, which we're going to fulfill in this budget. In fact, in the continuing resolution, we'll have that included that no matter what, the teachers will get that $35,000 in additional supplements where you give supplements. Uh, the list goes on. We had some challenges in the community colleges where part of the skills gap, we noticed, our, I noticed our spending formula was encouraging numbers as opposed to results which meant the high cost courses with lower numbers of people like mechanics and auto and things of this nature 
we're not being we're being paid for but not at the same rate as cheaper courses so the direction of some of our community colleges was let's take the cheaper courses with high volume but no one gets a job versus the low volume but higher cost courses but we have a hundred percent placement and um, we changed the formula in my first year as governor to ensure that we reward the results as opposed to numbers. And we need to do that everywhere in K through 12 community colleges and our universities and continually adjust looking at what are the results of the education versus the entry point. And uh, that's one of our great challenges to fill the skills gap for North Carolina. Well, fantastic. I'm actually, uh, my next question was going to be, what did you do about the challenges? But you've given such a good comprehensive answer, the first one about the challenges and the, and the steps you took. I'll probably go to the next question, and it's a more of a macro level question. I'd love to hear what your position is on the need for teacher assistance. Well, I think there is a need for teacher's assistance, but what I refuse to do is get into a debate on the state making the decision for each school. I don't believe. I personally believe we ought to have teacher assistance, especially one, first, second, and third grade. But each, each school is different. So what I think we ought to do in the budget, and what I've done in my budget, and I had a meeting this morning with legislative leaders and I express this very strongly, is that I think we ought to give the same set amount of money with the necessary increases due to the increase in students in North Carolina and let the schools decide on, do you want student assistance, do you want more teachers or you want a combination of both and even within school districts every school has different needs and I think that's a decision for the superintendent of schools to make or for the principals to make or even for teachers to make among themselves and not for Raleigh to make because uh, even within counties um, there are many many different types of schools and s teachers assistants may apply better to this school than to the other schools based upon the makeup of the students or what they're teaching and many other factors that are involved. So um, I don't believe in across the board decisions for every school system coming out of Raleigh, nor do I believe it should come out of Washington. So if I say that about Washington telling us how to do things, why should we in Raleigh be telling each school superintendent and principal and teacher how to do things? I want to give you as much flexibility as possible because each circumstance throughout our state is completely different. So I want to provide enough money where if the teacher's assistants are needed, they can hire the teacher's assistants. If they don't want the teacher's assistants, they can then hire more teachers. Thank you for the answer, Governor. Uh, in your past, you made the veterans an education priority. Could you elaborate uh, why? Yeah, one of the, to fill the skills gap needed in North Carolina, I'm looking for a competitive, uh, competitive advantage over the other states. I see the other governors about every uh, month and a half to two months. And Mickey Haley in South Carolina and uh, Bill Haslam in Tennessee and Terry McAuliffe in Virginia, they're very good friends, but they're tough competitors. And the number one issue is can we find talent to find the jobs when we're recruiting industry? And so we're all putting our cell in regarding our tax rates, our education, our quality of life, and other issues that sell industry. But the biggest issue is, can you find the talent to fill the jobs? And I don't think we're taking advantage of the incredible military installations that we have here and the men and women that are coming home from Afghanistan and Iraq and using them as potential resources to fill the skills gap in North Carolina. First of all, they deserve it, and they deserve our thanks, and we need to do everything we can to help them. So we've done two things. Uh, well, we've done several things. The first thing, uh, last year, we're at the end of this last session, we are now going to give in-state tuition, community college tuition and in-state uh, grants for our universities to men and women coming back home from Afghanistan and Iraq who are at one of our military bases. Even if they're not a citizen of North Carolina, we're going to give them in-state tuition. Most people don't realize, but the men and women stationed at Fort Bragg, most of them, uh, technically their home is in Florida or Texas or Colorado, it's due to income tax structure, they can put any residence they want as their residency. Uh, they're allowed to do that and they deserve that right, but when they come back to North Carolina and even if they're from another state uh, and they've moved from another state, I want them to stay right here in North Carolina and get a job. I was in Fayetteville last night and we're using that as a major recruitment tool in Fayetteville and Greensboro and Raleigh and, and across the state. 
so offering in-state tuition for the first year, then they become citizens of our state after the first year, they can uh, take advantage of our education system and then they stay here and work and our industries can recruit that mature leadership potential that we have. The second thing is that we need to help with the certification process. Sometimes I personally think in education we spend so much on talking about degrees, whether it be a two-year degree or four-year degree, the fact of the matter is the market is changing where a lot of people right now, um, industry says, I need certification, not necessarily a degree. You're seeing this in IT an awful lot. And so what we want to do, uh, even truck drivers, we have a major shortage of truck drivers in North Carolina, and it's a huge industry. And if we can't find the talent in truck drivers, those transportation industries will leave. So what we're telling the military is if uh, you can buy, if you can drive a truck, for example, a truck driver in Afghanistan under fire, we think you can probably do it right here in North Carolina, maybe. But we're not gonna make you go through all the hoops of going through all these courses. We're gonna allow you to do a competency-based training and see if you can do it right away. And if you can do it, fine, get out of here. And not have, frankly, the education bureaucracy make you go through steps when you already have that talent. I'm a big advocate of competency-based training and not people going through hoops on skills that they already have. And again, that will give us the competitive advantage, not just in truck driving, but in medical fields where we have a lot of people who get experience in medicine or medical assistance in um, overseas, um, in, on, in times of war, where if they can test out of certain medical education needs and they already have that skills, let them test out. So um, that gives us a competitive advantage to get that talent. Uh, it's a very thoughtful answer, Governor. As a, as a leader in the business sector, the veterans uh, is, is a source of diversity we often overlook right now, but I think thank you for bringing it up on the surface. And well, having we're a meeting with the uh, base commanders. I've been many times to each of the bases in North Carolina, and we're establishing a many, the minute the Fort Bragg commander changes, we meet with them and go, how can we get you into NC Works? And uh, that's very, very important. I might add our unemployment offices now are career centers. Uh, when people come into our major unemployment offices and they can't find a job, we're helping them immediately with their resumes. We're helping them connect them with our community colleges to see if there are any skill sets, and we're trying to connect them to employers as opposed to immediately getting on unemployment. So we've changed major procedures at our unemployment offices, and that's where education is extremely important at that stage in someone's life. Thank you, Governor. Uh, curious, the NC Supreme Court ruled in favor of opportunity scholarships, so what is your stance on school choice? I'm a firm believer, the more choice the better, but it's got to be good choices, and the choices should not fail our students. In fact, it's kind of interesting, I just read in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, I believe, that the uh, uh, President Obama's administration just came out on a rule regarding for-profit colleges where they're going to have to prove that they're getting our students, uh, their students, and if they're going to continue to get federal funding and scholarships at the for-profit colleges, they've got to sh measure how many of those students graduating are actually getting jobs. Well, frankly, I think that'll be applied to all of our schools, is how many of our students are actually getting jobs and are we directing them toward the job market as opposed to student debt. So um, I believe in choice. Uh, I believe in the charter schools. As long as the charter schools, there will be very high standards for the charter schools. We shouldn't make low standards. We'll accept any low standards for any school, and that includes charter school. And I believe choice raises quality, and it's, uh, it's very beneficial to education. All right, thank you. A little bit of a personal question. Uh, the first time I met you, I think we uh, just got elected, and we, uh, we met uh, with Jim Goodnight and a few business leaders to talk about the importance of STEM as oh. a huge value driver for North Carolina, and we were really taken with your passion towards, towards STEM right now, uh, and your, your very candid comments around what uh, we should be doing right now to further that. Where, what do you, in, your, in your opinion, what are the major macro-level areas where you think we've really made some strides in furthering that in North Carolina? Well, first of all, the marketplace, if you have a STEM academic background, you're going to get a job and we have a skills gap in STEM jobs at this point in time. I think one of the first things we need to do, especially in our K through 12 community colleges and our universities, is we're gonna have to start paying our teachers based upon what their market value is. And 
we've always been in a system where everyone, all teachers are paid the same regardless of market value. And that's just been the way we've done things. We don't do that in any other industry. But the fact of the matter is, right now, STEM teachers' market value is greater than any other market value, and they're harder to retain. And I personally think the market value of teacher pay should be based upon, or teacher pay should be based upon performance, and also market value should be a major criteria. I used to be a recruiter for Duke Energy Company many, many years ago in my early 30s, and I was director of training there too. And there are two things we did. We paid based upon the market value of the degree which they were graduating in, and it would change. Certain times a civil engineer would make more than an electrical engineer. Other times a nuclear engineer would make more than others because of the market value of supply and demand. I think we need to do the same thing with the teaching profession. And, or we're gonna lose the STEM teachers because industry is paying them much more at this point in time. We've gotta adjust our salaries, not based upon a civil service mentality, but more based upon the market value of the degree and the results of that degree on what we need in our educational system. And that, by the way, that not just applies to K through 12. We're having a heck of a time in our community colleges right now. There may be some community college presence there. We're losing our technical instructors because they're being stolen by industry and they can make money elsewhere. If we can't find the instructors um, in not only the community college but our universities, uh, we're gonna be in trouble. So that's a major challenge for us is to uh, adapt our pay schedule um, for educators at all levels of education, and one criteria should be market value, uh, not only at the entry point, but also as they graduate. The other thing that Eric Gukan, my, uh, my former education advisor, who I'm gonna miss greatly, we firmly believed in, um, in a career ladder for teachers. Um, I really learned this when I was in the private sector with engineers. Engineers tend to, um, the only way at one time for the engineering profession to get a promotion in business was to become a manager. Well, a lot of engineers didn't want to become a manager because you quit doing engineering work. And they were best as an engineer, not necessarily good as a manager. The dilemma we have in the teaching profession, the only way to get a promotion in the teaching profession often is to become an administrator. Well, a lot of teachers might not want to do administration, and frankly, a lot of teachers might not be good at administration because there are two different skill sets. I think we ought to have a promotional ladder for, uh, for teachers, um, like teacher one, teacher two, th who become leaders. You know, an experienced teacher who everyone looks to and looks to train, that teacher ought to be paid more. And we don't necessarily want that teacher to leave the teaching profession to make more money. We want the great teacher to stay a teacher, just like we want the great engineer to stay being an engineer, unless they want to also become a manager head up the company or become a principal. But they ought to have that choice. And that's another area where our pay system and the old way we think about paying in education has to change if we're gonna be competitive, not only nationally, but internationally. And uh, I lost that battle last year, but I'm gonna keep fighting it. Well, Governor, we know you're very pressed for time. We really appreciate the time. But I'd like to end on a final question, a more futuristic looking question, yeah. that you've given us a great insights into what's been done so far. What are your next steps in the, in the space of education? Well, uh, I think one area of education that we need to talk about more, and that is adult education. Um, our K through 12 um, community colleges and our universities primarily focus, community colleges is an exception, on younger people 25 and under. And in this changing economy, we need to figure out how to re-educate the 30, 35, 40, 50, eight-year-olds because of the changing marketplace. And we have to make it cheaper, we have to make it more accessible, and we gotta allow them to also keep working because they can't just quit and stop. They gotta keep making money, but they know in order to stay in a career, they've gotta do certain things. So one thing that I'm advocating this year in community colleges, there's no reason why our community colleges should take the summer off. Why, why don't we have year-round community colleges? And uh, because I've had adults come up to me and say, I can't wait three months to get this certification. I, I need it now. And uh, the other thing is we're looking at what we call um, Western Governors University, which is something Mitch Daniel, who was the governor of Indiana, uh, started along with four or five other governors 10 years ago, which is a online certification and degrees that's already been developed across the nation, and Indiana and many other states are using it, 
it's, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's a, a, a graduate degree at a very low price, and you can take it any place you live. And regardless of your income, you have access to it. And this will help people in both rural and urban areas of the state, because that's another area where some areas of the state, they have problems of getting access to good education. Online, we've got to look at ways to do it. And I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel to do it. And um, we've got some incredible opportunities to do that. And this is Mitch Daniels, who is former governor of Indiana. He's now president of Purdue University. And um, he's still a very strong supporter of this online opportunity. He doesn't see it as competition to Purdue because their average students up to 23, 24 years old. We are leaving out the adult learner right now and we can reach them immediately through this uh, online, very inexpensive, but high quality university. And it's not all on online. They actually have instructors who then facilitate online activity in every state. And I think it's a great opportunity for North Carolina and we're trying to raise some private funds to make that happen right now in North Carolina. So we have to think out of the box and be more competitive. And we can't think of education as we've done it in the past 50 years, we're gonna to have to see what the marketplace holds for the next 50 years. And those that adapt more quickly will be the states that are more competitive in the future. Well, Governor, it's been a privilege. Uh, music you. to my ears, adaptability. We've talked a lot, a lot about the fact that it's a pivotal time in North Carolina. Uh, I've heard you say it in the past that uh, one of the reasons for us to hope is the fact that it's a state where government, advocacy groups, education, businesses can be getting a room together in dialogue. And that's, uh, that's, that's critical right now. So we really appreciate your time. We really appreciate you coming down and answering our questions. I really hope you guys enjoyed the candid comments the governor made. So thank you so much for all your time. Thank you all very much. Thanks to the teachers especially. We appreciate you all. Thank you all very much.